Most investors feel comfortable with their domestic equity and bond portfolios because they tend to thrive during periods of economic growth and low inflation. And we don't blame you. It's been a great ride. But it's a big world out there, full of opportunities you may be ignoring. Sadly, we live in a world dominated by a fear of missing out, or FOMO. And in the last 10 years, U.S. equities and bonds have outperformed and generated massive amounts of FOMO. This hasn't always been the case. In the mid-2000s, the best performing markets were international equities, especially emerging markets, gold and commodities. So what happens if growth collapses and inflation becomes the new norm? Or what if the U.S. dollar collapses and U.S. assets are no longer attractive? What will the new FOMO markets be? And will your portfolio keep up or be left behind? Enter Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund, ticker RDMIX, a strategy that is designed to thrive across different markets and economic regimes. Unlike most traditional strategies that keep allocation static and let volatility happen, Adaptive Asset Allocation applies a proprietary systematic process designed to dynamically transition toward thriving asset classes and eliminate those that are not, all the while aiming for consistent volatility and stable returns. There's almost always a bull market somewhere in the world. Don't let yesterday's FOMO get in the way of tomorrow's opportunities. Instead, let Adaptive Asset Allocation help you fill in your domestic portfolio gaps. To learn more, visit RationalMF.com and check out the Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund. Welcome, everybody, to Pirates of Finance. Glad to have the booty yeah, crew here exactly. in the comments. Just, Welcome. Yeah, I can see. I can see. You must have mentioned your, it, did you? Just no, we were joking. Pirates of Finance. We were joking about, like, what, what should we call, like, the comment section? Somebody came up with booty crew. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> the booty crew. I love it. Um, yeah, Corey's already in the, uh, in the chats looking to set you up, Jason. Booty, so booty for bounty. And by the way, which one of you guys came up with rationalmf.com? That was making me laugh watching the the, the pre-roll. It's like, I know you guys love that's had that MF in there. I know. Yeah. Wish we could yeah. take credit. We love mutual yeah. funds. Thank yeah, you. that's what it stands for. Absolutely love <laughs> Who wants to say the deal, the disclaimer, guys? Is that going to be your, is our chief compliance yeah. officer going to do that? Uh, this, this has got to yeah. be an especially long disclaimer with Buck here. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. That we have no idea of who you are and what you want to do with your life. So please don't take any advice from us at four o'clock on YouTube Friday. Yeah, this is not, not advice. Not advice. Yeah, this is not. I repeat, this is not advice. Not life advice. Not investment advice. I told you, you you've <laughs> got to add the, the the trigger warning for Buck too, right? Um, oh some man, of what we talk about might 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 trigger you. Um, right. So be ready to mute. Um, yeah. If so you're, I, yeah. If you're I triggered, think we should we should definitely fire away. off with one of Corey's questions. Um, Jason, what advice do you have for Chairman Powell and the way he's handling the economy? Right now? Well, let me, I'm, I'm so glad you asked this, Corey. This was one of my favorite questions. So if I were running the Fed right now and I was Chairman Powell, here's how I would uh, rectify everything. <laughs> Obviously, I have no clue what I'm doing. I would never want that job. And what a terrible job to have. It's like, uh, man. I can't imagine having that job. What a night. By the way, before we start, though, I want to know what you guys are drinking. Mike, by the way, I got photos of what you guys were doing last night. So I have I have insider yeah, intel. Well, so, Mike, if you're drinking like tea there and coffee, I'm very disappointed. Dude, I know what you're doing I, last night. I, I am drinking <laughs> tea. Yeah, I'm, I'm having. Oh, right. You got insider bit. information. Right. I'm, I'm having. Yeah, a I have, I have photographic it. evidence of where you were last night. Yeah. I don't I come prepared. I don't know how you got that. And <laughs> I'm right. I'm. I'm <laughs> I'm extremely upset that the coven has been broken in some way, shape, or form. And there's been leaked information. I haven't put it yeah. online yet. Let's it just say that. Butler. No, that's good for you, Butler. I'm drinking water, but I'm drinking water because I am making it. We made, our team made it to the playoffs. Our Gaelic football team made it to the playoffs, and I had to play. Well, cheers tonight at uh, six forty-five, and then again on Sunday. So you know, I got to keep it healthy. Even last night, I was chasing every piece of alcohol with some water yeah you were being very Hydrate. mature and responsible last night i'm i ran home afterwards too <laughs> wow Balancing butler what are you drinking because with your guys you doing that background it like it goes in and out yeah. of like pixelation well, yeah. but always beer always beer for this guy yeah, yeah i like beer oh sometimes it's wine i'm too lazy to make cocktails they're, they're too sweet typically too 
I'm I, I'm having a tea, but it is with some you know blueberry schnapps in order to try and get recovering. You know, just tea something with smooth. blueberry schnapps. Oh yeah. Are there antioxidants yeah. from the blueberries in that? Is that um, the- that's that's what I'm trying to tell myself. <laughs> it's like it's like resveratrol. He only has to eat you know three tons of blueberries for it to make yeah, up exactly. last night. And well, you know, exactly. it's concentrated in the schnapps. So and and That's now fine. I'm even. Uh, I hope my only goal now is to make you guys feel bad about yourselves because I actually went champagne today to celebrating oh, being on Resolve no. Riffs, and uh, well, yeah, technically rocks, not dude. technically not champagne because it's from Oregon, so it has to be sparkling wine. But yeah, I hate yeah. the phrase sparkling wine, so it's champagne from Oregon from Grand Marain, uh, wow. absolutely delicious sparkling. So if you guys oh, get up to Oregon. Awesome. Everybody talks about Oregon Pinot, but their white wines, but especially their champagnes, their sparkling wines, are phenomenal. They're they're right up there with grower champagnes for a lot less of the price. So like everywhere we went in Oregon on a on a tasting trip, I was like, you guys should be just pushing these champagnes. They are world class. It's actually shocking. And I have a good actually a decent story from uh, when we were there. It was great. We we're sitting there with the uh, the winemaker, and he was like, uh, "Do you guys want to?" After we we're tasting all the different wines, he's like, "Do you guys want to go look at the vineyards, or would you like to go mushroom foraging?" I'm like, oh, uh, give me some truffles, oh baby. God. Mushroom foraging. So we went up in the, I can't oh, remember if it was in mushrooms. the, yeah, Cascades or the or the coastal range. We went up with the winemaker and he has all these, his secret uh, chanterelle spots. So we went foraging for chanterelles that day instead of going to look at the vineyard after, oh, that's after tasting cool. champagnes and whites. It was, it was, it was quite the day up in Oregon. Oh, wow. What awesome. were we drinking last night? Because that was we uh, were, fairly. We were in South Africa. And we did a, uh, we started with a white that was a non-oak Chardonnay from South Africa. And then we uh, hit the sort of, mm, you know, Bordeaux style-ish, um, you know, uh, Cab Cab Sauv, Cab Franc blends from uh, South Africa. I'm going to South Africa next week. So that's why we uh, hit the uh, South Africa. In, sp- in the spirit of that trip, yeah. yeah. There we Mike, young, how did it feel to be back in uh, Toronto? Um. Actually, Toronto was quite quite bustling and hustling. They, they've done a great job at uh, at disguising the downtown. So a lot of there's a lot of underground stores, a lot of stores that are closed, but they've done a great job of of making the facade look like it blends in, like it's just more hallway. Um, <laughs> I will tell you the interesting thing. You know, <clears throat> you can see how a city runs and and who's there by the Starbucks. Probably three out of four locations of Starbucks had closed, but mm. I'd say four to five Tim Hortons were still open. So the blue collar <laughs> that was running the city and uh, had to get in there was still there. The white collar has gone away for a while. Yeah, that's a good insight. Well, and just because Hofstein's in the comments and, and he's back in Massachusetts and he I even tweeted today that his six nearest coffee shops are Dunk, uh, Duncan. So, I mean, he has no idea. Timmy Hortons is by far superior to Duncan. You got to get Timbits oh, every time. I mean, How do you not go time. Timbits? Uh, yeah, I can. As a Canadian, I, I would lose my citizenship if I didn't. Does anyone on this, anyone listening, actually know what Timbits are? I mean, come on, don't oh, yeah. you guys call them donut holes? <laughs> yeah, but there's nothing like after after a after a, a grueling hockey game to just get a box of Timbits and just oh, crush those things. Out. That's the best. By the way, uh, shout out Jim Carroll's. I see in the, the comments too. No, Jim, I didn't get to nudes and vineyards, but uh, Jim, also known as the the, the nicest man in Fintwit, Carroll. It's always great to see him in the comments. By the way, I'm just taking this over. By the way, Very by the, gentlemanly. Yeah, yeah, thank that's, you. Thank you. So, so inside Jason, baseball here. Yeah, man, how do you guys comment on this? I can't. We can, I can't figure out how to comment on Streamyard. How do you guys comment oh, in here? In, I know you oh, guys I have no idea. I just I do it over do. the phone. I'm like double logged uh, in. Oh, okay. Because yeah, you can't comment on this when you're on it, right? Unless okay. you I are signed in as, um, as uh, like yeah. an admin or something. Administrator. Yeah, admin. I thought we actually used to be able to, but whatever. Well, um, Jason, what on on the uh, so I'm a big fan of Oregon, but also also Washington. Yeah. But I haven't I haven't I haven't delved in the whites in those regions or the sparklings. Is is Washington got the same sort of um, really good white side of 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 the uh, uh, winemaking, or is it uh, is it is it a little bit less like like Oregon just owns out of it? Yeah, I, I'm gonna disappoint you. Is like I've, I've probably mar- mainly just been Washington Reds. I haven't seen many yeah, Washington me Whites, but like yeah, the, the like I said, the Oregon Whites. But then you're making champagne from are incredible. As as uh, as Amanda taught me, under every great champagne is a great still wine, and this is why you want to drink your mm-hmm. champagne in a white wine glass because you want to be able to to get your schnoz in there. So that's what mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are missing is you know a, a great champagne is really just a great still wine with a little bit of with a little bit of bubbles to it. A little fizz. 
Look at the and wisdom you, being shared on this podcast. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, you, a competent host. Exactly. Are we supposed to like talk about anything, or is this going to be like uh, Corey and a show where we just uh, just talk out of our asses for an hour? Well, I'm glad <laughs> that you took over because I am really have brain dead from last night. Now, there was, See, this there is, was un, this is unacceptable. There was some liquidity last night, eh? By the time we were playing poker and drinking <laughs> drinking some uh, South African wine, um, I had to leave a little early. But how uh, how liquid did the poker night get? It seemed like there was a lot of action. Well, we 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 yeah, we bought we brought uh, more than a bottle each, and there was nothing left. And a bottle of cognac okay. got open. So must have been some big stacks by great. the end of the night. Then there was a couple. It was big a high variance play. Everybody else was done. You know, the when I was leaving, one person has all the money. When I was leaving, that's right. Like liquidity was raining on um, fools. Liquidity was raining sure. on some fools. Some poorly made decisions, make, bringing them millions yeah, and that, millions and of they dollars. Ended up it reminds me of something. <laughs> the last couple. That's right. We love. Market. That's why we love variance, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, are you guys, I mean, I just want to know not, did you cry when Corey left the island? But like, how much did you cry when Corey left the island? Oh, yeah. Well, there was a I'm big still crying. Was a what do you mean? Nope, this is not past tense. Yeah, there was a procession. I'm pretty well, sure we all he started was to leave the it island as well. Mode. Travel picked up. We all left. Yeah. It's been, uh, yeah, we missed them. We missed the pickleball tournaments that uh, Lauren used to put together. Yeah, Those I mean, are still going on, bro. I know, but you know, it's not the same without them. It's very are you true. going? Are you participating? I have, I have not. No, I've been away. I've been doing shit and whatever. I haven't had a chance to. All right. Okay. Let's well, look. Let's conversation yeah. with Jason's already that... yeah d done this for an hour. So, what did you guys talk about today? By the way, I'm curious. <laughs> I'm tired. As, you, as you, you were texting really me know. earlier, <laughs> yeah, we we never know what we're going to talk about, and now there's like it's only become almost like inside jokes. So like Jack will now ask us questions that we know, he knows we hate, just to like <laughs> just upset us to see if he can get me to go on a rant. Um, I don't even know what we talked about. What happened? I passed out. Uh, no, I tend to black out during that stuff. You know, with lives, it's different. Like your your energy is very attuned to it. So it's like uh, I can't necessarily remember. I I think I sent you the thumbnail was crazy or something like our commodities the new spacs. So Jack was yeah, just did, did messing with us. actually touch on that theme at all? No. Well, How did you no, connect the dots? Well, like Jack was saying, it's just like basically uh, both are going down and, and he's do, using the two-week horizon on commodities. So I think this is actually a, <laughs> a, a good spot for like, you know, is this a pullback or is a part of a longer bull market or did we roll over the top? I mean, none of us obviously know until hindsight. And then the whole thing is he like, he referenced the commodity complex, which, you, you know, all of us hate that. Like, it's very distinct, different markets. And then what are you actually using to trade commodities? Are you just buy and hold commodities? Or are you using trend following? So we kind of like, you know, touched on all those things. But I saw, you know, R Rodrigo, wasn't it yours? Like, you had a tweet where you were like, you, the tweet was like, you're defending yourself against the, the oncoming horde. So like, you know, yeah. I guess it's incumbent on you to defend trend following right now. And maybe we can talk about like the different markets a little bit too. It's like, that's the whole thing. You have such a diversity of markets. You have a lot of different trades on right now. Yeah, that's been, that's what's been interesting to watch, right? Like the, you have, in contrasting the narrative with the reality, right? The narrative has been recently, anyway, in the last six months that we're in an inflationary regime. And you, as you speak with advisors and allocators, they're like, oh, I'm fine. I don't need kind of CTA. I don't need active. I've hedged really well with, um, you know, energy ETFs or, you know, a long only commodity index, whatever that commodity index ends up being overweight. And I'm doing just fine. Right. And so at, in the beginning of the year, that inflation narrative floated all the commodity boats pretty much. But what we've been seeing in the last few months is divergence, right? Dispersion between that, that space. A couple of months ago, we started going short copper, short platinum, short palladium, when energies were still the dominant commodity. And recently, pretty much everything has, at least for our systems, has started to roll short with the exception of energies, right? And so mm -hmm. what is inflation right now? Like when you, when you explain commodities are going to help me in inflation, well, what does that mean? Because energy is still up. Everything else rolling over, right? Copper, the PhD in economics has been telling us that there's possibly some sort of signaling in the last four to six months. Um, and so it's just this, what I tweeted today was the view that in the beginning, they, a lot of people realized that they needed to start thinking about inflation risks. In the last few m months, maybe weeks, a lot of advisors have started to sh sell their sovereign bonds because they've been decimated and allocated towards commodities to, to, to benefit from that hedge that they've seen in the last few months. 
right before that whole thing seems to have been correcting and sovereign bonds have gone up, right? Like this is always the lagging indicators, um, always a step behind um, the narrative, right? So what is that? And in the what background, of course, you've got, you, you've got, you know, 99% of people who are just only looking at equities. And, right. you know, we, there, there's still this um, incredible faith and confidence in, in the buy the dip crowd. You know, it's, yeah. it's remarkable. I mean, obviously there's some structural flows and speaking of structural flows, I've been seeing some numbers thrown around that there's a little over $100 billion in rebalancing flows um, coming out of bonds and into equities this um, toward the end of this month or the next week or so. So we can certainly credit those flows for um, some of the moves that we're seeing in, in, in equities and, and bonds here. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just amazing how in the short term we can build narratives like strategic narratives around what we're observing in market behaviors and tie it to something fundamental or economic. But in reality, it is, you know, completely dominated by, by just flows, by like structural flows, by um, target date funds or balance funds, et cetera, that just are, are forced to rebalance on, on certain schedules. And obviously end of the month, end of the quarter, there's a confluence of, of these overlapping schedules. So you're going to get even larger moves, right? What are you trying to What's say? Are you, are you saying do you have something against my uh, uh, copper having a PhD in economics? No, no, no. I like that. Copper's <laughs> well copper's known. not That's on like the rebalancing oh, docket, Dr. Right? Copper. But yeah. no, but I was going somewhere with that though, because no. I think there's a there's a hope still among equity investors that you know the the Fed can sort of navigate slowing the economy enough to um, to cap energy prices, to manage food food and energy inflation and sort of core inflation. Um, without killing growth. And so you're going to have, there's the equity investors still seem to believe that um, there, there could be a bid or some sort of, you know, we, we can resume the upward trend in, in, in growth stocks or in, you know, uh, cap weighted equity indices. I, I think the reality is if the Fed is going to take their foot off the gas here, then yeah, equities might do okay for a while, but, but inflation estimates are going to start rising again. And then, you know, mark, uh, investors are going to start looking out further and be like, okay, so now we're going to let inflation run, run hot for a while, which is just going to mean that we're going to have to raise rates more down the road. Right. So this is, this is very reflexive system um, going on. And if they actually manage to slow growth enough to um, moderate energy and food prices, then the economic damage that will, is required for that given con supply constraints in those sectors is so large that there's no way that equities, you know, skate, skate by without a, a material um, depreciation. Right. So like, if you're, if you're so, going to so be Adam, bullish equities, you should be seriously bullish energy. If you're right. going to be bearish energy, you need to be even more bearish equities. Like, like there's right. no, there's no inner, you know, this, this is, this is, this is, this is sort of the exact opposite cycle from the cycle we've had over the last decade, which is one of bad news is good news and good news is good news. Right. That economy, was the last decade. Exactly. That's the last yeah. decade. We are, yes. in, we are in the bizarro world of that. There is no escaping it as well. And we are now we're transitioning through whatever you want to call it, the transition in beliefs, right? The Overton window of the way people are viewing things. And we're at the beginning of that cycle. We're not in the middle. We're still living in the hope of the last cycle using the tools and the beliefs and the habits of the previous cycle. And this is what's wonderful about systematic approaches is that's not how that works. You observe mm -hmm. and you adjust and you, you refuse the narrative. But we are, it, it, it is incredibly important, I think, when you have a regime change of this nature that you just observe what's going on and believe what you're seeing. All news is now bad news. If we get increase in uh, demand and we have the opportunity for growth to come back, that is what tightens, is choked by the lack of supply of the underlying commodities that we require. And thus, that's not what they're going to allow happen. And so now if we get global growth, you are going to get more action that's negative from the Fed. You're going to get more rate increases. Exactly. Yeah. And so we're now caught in this feedback loop that is precisely the opposite of the last decade. 
and uh, it's just it's 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 tough to swallow, I guess. People have to recondition well, their clients well, and investors. As, as part of that, to a though, new do you think they get over to you guys? Yeah. No, do you think that part of that is like they just like we see that capitulation because the academic literature or buddy Matt Faber always harp on that's like usually around a negative 20 percent drawdown in S&P is where people start to hit the panic button, at least historically. And so far, we've only seen it on like a intraday or on an intramonth basis where we got like negative 23 percent plus on the S&P drawdown. And so like reality doesn't like hope turns to fear at once we start getting past negative 20 percent or you just think that's an arbitrary number and it might need to be much deeper? no i think it's it's actually the right number but it's it is it is the secular trend and then we have these cyclical moves around that secular trend and if we think back to 2000 it was minus seven minus 12 minus seven but there were huge rallies along the way you went down 20 22 25 then you rallied 15. I don't know if you guys recall or, or remember, but back in 2000, you know, some of the timing models that people had, they were simple, whatever. They got out yeah. of the market. But then when we had that spike back pre-1 to 2001, they got back in and then they got crushed. So all those simple timing models are going to suffer the vagaries of being whipsawed. You do get whipsawed in, in these simple timing models for equities, right? Everyone knows that. Yeah, and now sure. we're in a position where this volatility moving back and forth is going to create some of those whipsaws. And so because the secular shift is now more down and yes, you're going to have target date funds rebalancing and they're going to put a cyclical spin on this, but the major trend, the major muscle movement here is in the opposite direction. And so yeah. it's going to take time. I think Jason for that to be realized and the rallies that people want to do rebalancing when it rallies, it won't rally far enough or they're going to believe, look, I was right to hold. And then they're going to get punched in the face again. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's incredibly a, painful. If you actually look at the granularity, like you were saying between 2000 and 2002, I believe there's six or seven uh, like dead cat bounce rallies that were plus 20%. So like, on. can you imagine like trading through like, you're just going to get your face ripped off. No, I it's, think it, it's the people it's are not the, used to those types of bear markets, right? Those long right. kind of multi-phased bear markets like we had in from 2000, 2003. Um, you know, they're used to these waterfall crashes and yeah. anyone who's, who's kind of trading trend equity type strategies. Um, I think a lot of people have kind of calibrated models to those types of crashes and this type of market, which is kind of this multi-phased, um, long drawn out type of phenomenon is, um, you know, just extremely destructive for, for those types of models that are that are tuned to those uh, waterfall crashes. And there's also going to be required. there's also going to be something that's very different in this cycle is the difference within even the S&P 500 sectors, right? The last 10 years has been liquidity on liquidity off. There's been very little variance between the different sectors, different securities. Um, there's been massive differences between bonds and equities, right? Because you've got uh, sovereign bonds offsetting the losses of equities. So there's an intuition of what the market feels like, right? There's a, there's like a 10 year past intuition, which is by the dip, everything goes down, you buy whatever you can, it all goes up together. In these types of markets where there is more differentiation, it's slow sector rotation, right? So, you know, energy, energy ETF is up 40% year to date. That's a stock energy ETF, right? So there's, there's going to be in the seventies, for example, the equities you wanted to be in were the equity markets that had the ability to flow through the increase in, in prices and the sector that has the ability to do that the best is the whole commodity spectrum, the whole commodity sector. Um, that, that creates opportunities for even sector rotation strategies, right? And yeah. if, if we are trying to time the S&P, like, I don't know, there's a few providers out there just trying to time that one equity line, that's a problem. But if you're actually looking at dispersion and opportunities, um, that used to work in the 2000 to 2010 period and certainly worked in the 70s, then you, I think you're going to find it and you're going to see a lot more value. But we have to, like like Mike said, people need to like rewire themselves. And that's the last 10 years. The, the addition of inflation as another dynamic, people need to rewire themselves for the last 40 years. And by people, I mean individuals, foundations, corporations, and pension plans, right? What What... CIO today or what percentage of CIOs today have their lived experiences in the 70s 
versus yeah. being in the from zero. 1981 to now. Uh, well, I, zero. I remember, I remember the 70s. You professional career. In the yeah. 70s, Mike. Mike was born in 81. You were, you were, I'm not buying it, Mike. <laughs> you were in your diapers. <laughs> yeah. No, no. But, I remember I remember lining up in, in the car, being in the back of the car, waiting for gasoline. I remember. Right. But you weren't Carter trading era. to Rod's point. No, no, I wasn't trading, yeah. but you were aware, ever aware. I was in farming. We had a mortgage. Listen, the way you squeeze the credit cycle uh, to its death and cause people to think about if they're going to go to dinner and a movie or pay off their mortgage because it's 18% on your mortgage, that's how you squeeze leverage out of the system. You change your, the behavior was so uh, different. There was so much less debt in the system and it, there was so, so much less overall aggregate debt and everyone was focused on paying their debt. If you chose to consume, there was a serious cost to that consumption because you had to, you could pay off your mortgage. You could pay off any debt that you had. So any, it was, my wife and I grew up in a place where you went out as a family, maybe once a month. And you went out to a family as a, you know, dinner and a movie once a quarter. Yeah. And you look at the consumer society we have today and the habits we got into, which was, why would I ever pay off my mortgage? It's just rent. Housing always goes up. My payment always go down. Again, this is different in a 40s like experience in a 70s like experience. This is all very different. And we try to make analogies of even 2000, 2001, 2002. It's worse. It's probably 73, 74, 75. And now we haven't even considered the aspect. We're talking nominal. I want to talk real. Or I want yeah, to talk that's about a good point. This is, this is, this is the mind. This is a mind. This is a specific. I had a conversation with an advisor today and he said, look, um, you know, I think, you know, I love, love what you guys are doing. This is a um, good offset, whatever. I think the best offset right now is cash. So we're raising cash and finding opportunities. And I said to him, listen, that's that's the strategy that has worked over the last roughly 40 years, because there's no downside to getting into cash when equities are going down. But there's a massive downside when you have inflation at 8 percent. All of a sudden, this idea that cash is trash has to come into the site. And he, and he, had, he was having a hard time with it. Right. Like, I don't understand. I have opportunities to to buy at a lower price. And my answer was, well, you had opportunities to buy it and even higher price by in transition to things like commodities or CTAs that are making you money, right? That's your, right, but if cash. they don't That's do that, that but if, if they, they do... but if their mindset can't even wrap around that, they're kind of right. Like if, let's just say we knew perfectly that like 8% is eating away their cash position, but then the S and P is down 30%. Like what mm -hmm. are they better off in? Right. Having the opportunity to, to, to rebalance that cash back into that at the low, low nav point, like you're saying in a perfect world, you would have held commodities. that would give you hopefully a convex cash position to relation and you would have been able to buy at a better nav point. But like, that's, that's not how people operate. And I, I'm curious, like you, how you guys think about this is like, you know, the whole thing, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. I mean, you know, we use these historical analogs, like Mike's bringing up like 73, 74, or even the 1940s. The problem is like, it's never going to be the same as that. And I, I get worried that we, we, we really, we really try to tag into these historical analogs because it makes it feel that we understand this market. But like, like you were saying, Mike, even when you guys are going out, like maybe once a month as a family, but you also didn't have internet. Like, so it's like, like how, how did well, these- Jason, Jason, you're, I just let me, you are, I want to just say you are absolutely right. Timestamp that. Yeah, a hundred percent. The the challenge no, is so we teach or we share as human beings with story and analog. I think your caveat is incredibly important. It's probably not a caveat. It's probably the main line, right? Is listen, this is different. This isn't the seventies, but there's some characteristics that have some structural impacts to asset prices that are similar to that. And those things you should be paying more attention to because this ain't the 2000s and the two and the and the 2010s. This ain't that. So right. the problem is people are super identified and comfortable with and have a, an overconfidence driven by a recency bias of the experience they've had lately, and they think that's what's going to continue. And they plan from the achieved level. And when you have a regime shift of some kind. It's all we can say is it's different. Here's some other times that were different. Please look at these because you need to sort of internalize that it's not going to be like it was. 
And so what else can we do? We're just trying to do the best we can. We can bring up Japan, right. we can you, bring up emerging markets. Go ahead. So you're, say, you're saying that you got, we should prepare, not predict, and we should be adaptive. <laughs> you see <it? laughs> Some those words do sound familiar. I mean, look, the, the, what, I, what I want to push back, uh, Jason, I know you like to go turtles on us. <laughs> nothing ends up working and there's nothing that rhymes. But the reality is that there is, look, let's go back to uh, Yoel Noah Harari, right? We are, we are human beings that have built narratives and those narratives are human, um, uh, end up adding up to being somewhat predictable uh, human interactions, right? What, that cause and effect relationships of what we care about, right? So what does inflation, inflation cause human beings to do and how are they predictably likely to act and what asset cl classes are likely to make money in that environment? So there's a few inflation, growth dynamics, liquidity dynamics, right? Sentiment dynamics that we can understand are likely to be a certain thing in any one of these regimes, right? So inflation causes people to, um, to, to spend less money on gasoline and drive less. And what, what are the knock-on effects of that? The, if you examine that, and then you know, okay, I should allocate, I should have exposure to all these asset classes, things that will react to these things. Bonds, equities, commodities, maybe some active management and long, short, multi-asset. My issue is that, and, and so that, this is where I get, you understand that dynamic, you have the tools in place, and then we can talk a little bit about, you know, the, the cockroach portfolio and prepare, preparation versus prediction. But what bothers me is the, even if you examine just a little bit how those dynamics affect our asset classes that most investors today still don't have the asset classes in place just in case those dynamics happen, right? In case there is a liquidity shock, in case there is an inflation regime. We still are in this world of only believing that the dynamic that works is high growth, low growth. That's it. Yeah, I think, right? I think it's, it's, it's not that we... And it's not just us, obviously, everybody who's sort of talks about the importance of understanding economic regimes makes similar points. The points are not we're entering the 70s or in, we're entering the 40s. And, and so you need to use the same playbook. The point is to sort of jar investors out of their um, their trance, right? They're sort of they're the, the lived experience leading to overconfidence in a certain type of approach. Um, because this approach has worked well over, you know, the past five or 10 years and to sort of just illustrate, to point to examples of where the approach that they think is gospel is the only way to think about investing long term has some major blind spots. And here are some examples of where those blind spots cause damage, but acknowledging that the current environment is not going to look like the 70s. It's not going to look like the 40s. It's going to be its own environment, but it's going to be an environment that challenges the consensus view on what the appropriate kind of strategic allocation is. So let's let's first start with um, we acknowledge that that let's say sort of typical global 60/40 um, goes through multi-decade periods where it underperforms cash and underperforms or, or delivers negative real returns, multi-decade periods where it delivers negative real returns. And acknowledging that, what are some of the tactics that we can aim, add to our portfolios in order to give ourselves a better chance of being successful, regardless of what economic environment that we face in the and market environment that we face in the future, let, right? Let me ask in a different way, kind of, by the way, Rod, I appreciate the uh, the turtles all the way down. I know I'm I'm annoying as shit, and if you want to be, you just seen I got Adam and I at some point. Uh, you you just seen Adam and I's breakfast at Tilly's talking about free will. I mean, you want to talk about cringy eye rolls for three hours? Like nobody would want yeah, to yeah, listen yeah. to that. I but by the way, but, we're gonna go there. Yeah, but like uh, Mike Hartman, the comment uh, said, uh, you know, I'm still in my pajamas, and Corey was making fun of me on the last show. I literally wore my best pajama shirt and brought champagne today, just you know, out of out of pure respect for the Resolve crew. So this is where where we're starting at. But I had to. An interesting no different way of looking. Pajamas. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> is what if, okay, you guys, are, you know, you're talking about people need to be jarred and they need to be woken up. Let me ask you in a different way. And this might be a little bit too inside baseball. It's like, you know, you go out here with your megaphone and you do resolve riffs, you do all the other content you guys, you guys do a great job. 
but you're really looking to to find your your like-minded cohort that believes what you believe and that they need to prepare not to predict and they need to be adaptive and so all the other things that like not for lack of a better word complaining about that people need to be jarred they're they're thinking an old mentality they need to adjust all of those things are actually beneficial for you and your strategies those are where the returns come from so do you really want the whole world to wake up and do what you do or are you trying to look for that less than you know maybe single digit percentage that believes what you believe so you're just always constantly trying to talk to your your core esoteric audience and you actually you. make money off of the people doing the opposite of that let me tell you something i tried that for 10 years I'm ready. I'm ready to try a new strategy. <laughs> well, so, no, hold on, hold on, no, hold on, hold on, because so, there's two, there's two points there's two there, right? Yeah. I love the yeah. start, though. Let me tell you something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Old man River over here. He's got you know, <laughs> just jaded. I, solid, solid. I think. I mean, you know, obviously, global diversification, whatever you want to sort of call that, yep. right? Risk parity or or you know, balance. Um, I think this is a strategy that everybody can adopt and know, and, and everybody wins. Um, you know, this is, this is farmer fable stuff. So, you know, yeah. I don't, I think that sort of basic, you could have a, a, an approximate kind of global risk parity approach that everybody adopts and it ends up being macro efficient, right? The, the, the constitution of the global market cap weighted portfolio will change as people sort of adopt this view, but eventually if everybody decides that they want to take a global diversified kind of risk parity approach, the global market portfolio in aggregate will resemble a global risk parity portfolio. It's macro efficient. So everybody can benefit from this approach at the same time. And because what we're advocating on the, on the sort of core strategic side is relatively stable through time. It, I don't think it has any, there's no reason to expect it to have any impact on the structural edges that that we arbitrage using the kind of active approaches that we that we utilize either, right? I mean, yeah, sure. If everybody kumbayas and they say they're never going to trade and they're only going to hold the global market portfolio and the global market portfolio begins to resemble a global risk parity portfolio, then who are who are we trading against? So that's fine. But that's not really the expectation. But, but we don't right? we don't have to trade against anybody, Adam. In in a place where the, everyone decides that um, risk parity or risk is the way to allocate, everyone has their arms wrapped around this risk weighted portfolio, and people are only coming and going. They're getting the best. They're getting getting the best combinations of betas. And so I think this discussion is one of what is the beta side of the portfolio, yeah, and how that happens, and what's the adoption rate there. And what's the alpha side of the portfolio? And the alpha side of this portfolio is subject to constant adaptation. It is subject to the red queen effect of Alice in Wonderland. You must run faster than everybody else still. to maintain the edge just to stand yeah. still, right? So there, this is a little bit of two conversations. At the same time, Jason, I think that we have suffered the slings and arrows, as Rod has said, over the last 10 years of lack of dispersion, central bank yeah. control, um, uh, the fact that trend suffered a dead decade. Listen, it's great to have that dispersion back. It's great to see these things change. And we truly want to do good. We wanted to do the good in the previous 10 years. We have hauled, and I knew you have as well, the albatross of diversity, the albatross of diversifying across different types of strategies, different thinkings, having things like tail protections in portfolios. We've had that albatross and it hasn't helped all that much. Uh, against the pervasive benchmark. So now that we see those opportunities expanding, yeah, we want to holler from the rooftops to try and bring money in for our for our selfish purposes. But it's also to help those achieve their financial goals through the next sure. decade. And again, we come back to, yeah, well, we it's not the same. I can tell you, or I think we should have at least the same degree of confidence that the next decade won't be like the 2010s either but what we know as a recency back uh recency bias behavioral vulnerability is people will think it's going to be much more like 2010s than any other decade mm -hmm. and so that's the vulnerability that we're trying to illuminate and educate on in order to bring people over to what we think is the proper way to do this and that should have some outsized benefits going from a pendulum swinging one side to the other but when we get to 1980, you know, one, two, 
yeah, you might have to think about yeah. things a little differently. Yeah, well, but well, I, look, it's, let me just finish that that thought up. Yeah. Um, there is an element of like the Elon Musk, I will build um, electric cars so that others build electric cars and society benefits, right? We're right. not, like if we just wanted to make money and do our own thing, we, we would have done it independently, silently. But we are, for one reason or another, really passionate about education. And for me, at least, it really is years and years of frustration of trying to get people prepared. Knowing the social destruction that comes with retirees seeing their wealth get cut in half while taking money out every month, right? Like that's a devastating reality <clears throat> to a nation. And there's, there is a little bit of if we build it, everybody else that's around us doing the similar things to you guys, we all do this together. We all benefit and society benefits as a whole. I, I, I resolve on its own won't be able to get as many people to do the right thing for themselves as much as having, you know, the mutiny guys and, you know, everything, the Corey and, and so on actually rally the troops, get the word out there, get the bigger microphone up to a certain point, right? There will be a point where, if everybody's doing it, then we're going to have to start cutting you off. We're no longer invited to the podcast. Resolve is so much better than mutiny and so on and so forth. Exactly. But we're, we're at least you know, two decades. But it's more before It's before that. It's like I understand like what you guys were saying, especially Adam was saying about. And by the way, I thought of a question I thought on my walk this morning for Adam. I'll get to it a little bit later. Um, but the... I'm not worried about the aggregate size, like what if everybody's doing risk parity or something like that. It's it, I was actually going in a slightly different direction that Rod, you and Mike were touching on a little bit, is the idea of like the obstacle is way. Like whatever we're complaining about is actually the, the opportunity set. And I think about like like Starbucks, right? Like everybody likes to shit on Starbucks. Without Starbucks, we wouldn't have all this third wave coffee around the fringes. And my point is like the cool, interesting shit is always at the fringes. So when you're at the fringes, to complain about the, the general populace is kind of like anathema. Like you wouldn't have a job unless there was that that bifurcation between what you do and what other people do. Um, I think it was great when a long time ago, Ben Hunt was like on your podcast. And everybody knows I'm not a huge Ben Hunt fan. But um, he did talk about the idea with what you guys do versus another firm that may have like a charismatic leader that's a global macro, you know, crystal ball predictor. You won't be able to raise as much AUM because you're building an artisanal pragmatic product product. And it's only for a certain amount of people around the fringes. And so that's what I'm more getting at is this inside baseball idea of like, you know, we're inevitably going to be have fringe products, but you you need to find your audience for that fringe product. And I'm not sure it's uh, necessarily helpful to complain about the other side because that other side is what gives us an advantage. It gives us something to to look different from. And that's what I mean, like about the obstacle is kind of the way in that sense is like that's what I'm saying is more from that marketing perspective is knowing that we're different is where you're different because the the herd is going in one way and you're trying to go in a different way, but that will always be at the fringes of society. And then the people that really like to look for the fringes of society, you end up probably building a stronger, more esoteric group. That is because they do feel different from everybody else around them. So Jason, can I ask you a question on that? Just to, yeah. do you constantly live in the fringe or like John Vogel, when indexing was the fringe in 1970 and 80 and he, propagated this idea but it then became the herd how is that the goal do you want to sort of have the fringe that becomes the herd or do you want to just sort of stay perpetually in the fringe what what what's the outcome there i mean well i think as we know this this business is filled with an enormous amount of money. So even the, the tiddly winks or breadcrumbs are more than enough for all of us to live off of on the fringes. And, and sure. I think Bogle, the difference I think with that example of Bogle is he didn't necessarily have an opinion right? Like he just created a, a, a product or a strategy. Like we always talk about, like everybody will talk about different options, um, strategies, but like no, you're putting on a structure, you're not actually trading a strategy. So Bogle more created a structure. He didn't necessarily create a strategy and that's why it gained a lot of popularity. But the, the I, I'll think about it. I would take that. I would. I, oh, so I, I, I mean, would, it's a momentum help, strategy. Help me, if that's, yeah. Help me understand that premise a little bit because the, the structure I do get, because he did have a unique structure, but that structure was based on using a market cap weighted waiting scheme for the portfolio which has a momentum so yeah. we agree but that that was pretty unique back then i mean that was a fringe idea and a, and a fringe structure that became mainstream no How, yeah but the part of that, that? I, I i agree with you but it was like he the, the the constraints and the choices they made were not necessarily a strategy it was like just figuring out what would work to create those index funds but part of it too is okay. that 
as, as we talked about history doesn't repeat it rhymes is like that was a totally different time right we're in a much more advanced structure for where people can you know allocate their assets so yeah i hope you guys are yeah i hope you guys become vanguard but i'm i'm just saying it doesn't in my mind it I'm doesn't help sure any do. of us to think about it that way like <laughs> i'll say it another way is like i always talk about to like uh, long ball managers right is like you're never ever going to be a hero you need to have some much more like intrinsic motivation than extrinsic in the sense that like you know when when the good times are rolling you're just bleeding out and everybody hates you right then the sell-off happens let's say you have a convex return Everybody treats you like an ATM and nobody says thank you. So now you're just losing AUM because you did your job, right? Mm -hmm, so you're like, mm -hmm. okay, great. I get no pats on the back either. So great. You come home to your, your spouse or significant other and you're like, look what I did today. And they don't give a shit either because your spouse or significant other that's going to be in a relationship with a long volatility person already knows you're a weirdo. And they're like, great, you did your job. So you literally like there's no applause. There's no ticker tape parade. Like you better learn to take a craftsman's perspective of like this is an artisanal product. And I take joy in what I do on a minute by minute basis because there is no parade here. We just lost like 30 percent of long haul oh, no. managers in our chat. I don't like, think yeah, there's I, 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 I don't think there's a dichotomy here, mate. I don't, no, think, I don't so. think so. Either. I think there's I, a I core. The same. There's a core that everybody can adopt and everybody benefits from. And there's an explore that is zero sum and that. We don't, you know, I'm delighted that very, very few people adopt our approach to harvesting active edges. <laughs> but I am also all for everybody taking a much broader view of diversification and building a more comprehensive, resilient, diversified core for their, for their portfolio, right? So in sort right, of a right. core explorer framework, the core is good for everyone. And the explore is the fringe, right? Like, it's absurd. Bogle was too successful. He convinced everybody that this bullshit 60-40 portfolio is the only thing that everyone needs to own forever. And he also was extremely home biased. You know, he 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 almost never advocated for for global diversification, right? It was extremely U.S. centric. So you know, Bogle was 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 too successful. He he persuaded people of this view which ex post happened to be right. You know, there were there was hundreds of bogles back in this in the 70s who had a very strong view about the optimal long-term portfolio. They all had made a lot of sense. You know, Harry Brown came, was it was out in the 80s as we both discussed. Had a very compelling story and and a really good portfolio and you know, we're not singing Harry Brown's praise, praises the way that we sing Vanguard's praises cuz just ex post Bogle happened to be right, right? B uh, Buffett was born in the U.S., so he looks like a genius. If he was born in Japan, we would never know Warren Buffett. Or he could Argentina. have outperformed That's the right. Nikkei by yeah. by eight percent a year and still have been down for thirty years, right? So, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of approaches to the market. Some of them have they gain adoption and they end up being correct ex post. It doesn't mean they were ever the smartest approach. It just means yeah. that that happened to be the way that the world evolved. But I'm, I, I, I'm, I've been I, the narrow constraints that I define this. So that way I can try to win the argument because I'm using the constraints I'm, I'm defining is like you guys start the, 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 the defense is on you is that you guys started this conversation of like, how do we wake up people from their somnambulance? And like mm -hmm. Rodrigo saying is like, I don't want to do that job anymore. And my point is like, you can't convert anybody and you guys know this. So it's oh, like, I who agree. cares what everybody else Jason, does? You're just trying to find the people that agree with you. So like, well, what are we talking about? Okay, though? hold on a second. No, I think there's, there's, this is not a binary decision here, right? That there is, we've talked about this before. I think Mike's talked about it in the past. Adam's talked about it in different podcasts, this idea that yes, <clears> indeed, <throat> people don't make thoughtful introspection, you know, uh, uh, observations about the market and, and then make a smart plan that they execute on. It's the crisis necessity change, right? And during that crisis, Adam's used this analogy before that he, when he had moments of growth, was when he was an empty vessel ready to receive, right? And and you you search something terrible happened, a crisis happened in his. Thought I was about process to say, was he was he was he, sorry, sorry, was he open for growth, or he was at such a, a a trough of life that anything would have pulled him out of that trough? So you're overlaying what happened with just tr peaks and troughs, right? Again with the turtles. Is there if any he's a smart man? He reasonable only found difference a between those two. Improvement, a much right. better approach through thoughtful introspection at that point. But there is a transition moment, right? And there's 
there's moments where nobody's in transition or very few is in, people are in transition because everything that they've been fed for 40 years has been working, right? And so the right. idea of education is you're always trying to catch as many people in the transition, that empty vessel willing to change, that horse who is going to the water to drink in order to maximize um, getting them to take the red pill that seems to be most congruent with their long-term goals, right? Not get caught up in in NFTs, but rather get caught up in, we don't know a lot about the future, let's be diversified and growth, right? Right now, today, we are going through a major structural transition in markets that is creating an opportunity for more vessels being emptied and more people looking for information. And we, together, need to have a biggest microphone to get these people not to blow themselves up in the next hot thing, right? And so I think there's, there's an opportunity here to not just be find your people, but rather aim that microphone at a lost uh, group of individuals that are looking for guidance. And, and we're, we're in a great spot right now to do that. And we're seeing- Nobody goes to God on prom night, Yeah. right? The last 10 years have been a series of prom nights. So now we've got some reality kicking in. These are normal markets. The last 10 years have are the outlier, <laughs> you know? So so get used to normal markets again. And, you know, just that realization alone, I think can have an enormous impact on people's thinking about their future and how they should approach this, you know, long-term wealth problem. Like there's, think there's, of nomadic, there's a couple of nomadic things. Samuel was mm -hmm. so last thing, right? Like yeah, he, go ahead. he went from being a, a very different person four months ago. Yeah. And then starting to pull on a string, getting all the way to risk parity and cockroach and all this stuff. Like he, he really would like fill this vessel with something fairly unique. That was not my person more, six months yeah. ago, right? Half of the advisors I'm talking to today were not my people six months ago. That's their personalities weren't the technically oriented men that we have that we tend to attract in a lot of these, uh, our internal discussions, these are people that are all walks of life that are now realizing that we have something in common. We need to survive this. We need to thrive. How do I do that? Not, but that's now a, we have that's, an opportunity. Even yeah. using nomadic Samuel, and by the way, shout out to Sam, is like, that's the, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is like, we're all just yelling to the wind and then we're just trying to find our tribe. And and this relates, well, by the way, I was, I was smiling too, but Rod, because uh, we both had recent uh, additions on Nomadic Samuel's podcast. And he texted me the other day that my read time's longer than yours. And I was like, yes, my only life goal is to bury Rodrigo. Did you really, did he, did you beat me? He didn't share that with me, I'm very excited. So, so I have, I have a few I thoughts. I thought it would last at least a year. Yeah, that's funny. I have a few thoughts on some of these these topics. One is okay. So uncommon results are going to come are not going to come from sort of common approaches. So if right. you would like to sit with the herd and you're comfortable with the herd, then that that's you know the, the herd's zeitgeist is going to change and your mindset is going to change, but it's going to change within the herd and you're going to be very comfortable because you're both profiting and suffering from all of your brethren, and we know the behavioral bias that comes with that. I come back to when you're educating people, yes, we're on this microphone talking about things it today and today's tribe and today's receptive audience that might join our tribe changes. And it, so I look at it as I, we talk about this all the time. It's like a conveyor belt. There's a whole bunch of people that are moving through time. They're growing older. Their preferences are changing. And here we are as well, speaking and talking to that group and as Rodrigo is mentioning, there's just these different levels of receptivity to certain things that we're offering. And so, yes, I think you're right, um, Jason, we are on that track. We are doing those things. And the receptivity of the tribe as a whole is going to ebb and flow. What I want to come back to philosophically being different, right, is really hard and painful. So you, you're, you're long vol manager. Yeah. Right. Life's that hard. person has a certain personality that can't function unless life is like that. That for them is their nirvana. And they're trying to find others in their tribe that are similar in that in that vein. So my fear is for me anyway, because one of my superpowers is irreverence. I can stand by my fucking self with a, an opinion that is totally different than everybody else's and be slung, whipped, 
and I will refuse to change my mind. So it's good at some endorse, no. and endorse. it's not good at other points. Right. It's the hard part. Interesting. Yeah. Let me let me just finish because yeah, the, the final point is so for people who are at the fringe and become more in the middle or receive adoption through whatever means that's changing the zeitgeist can you change can you become the one who sits on the fringe to someone's in the middle or will you get there and say i gotta start a new business that's more on the fringe again because i'm uncomfortable that everyone's doing what well, i'm this doing this is see i i i have thought about this right are we zealots are we just as yes. zealot as the nft guys or the gold bugs right yes aren't we all that and my answer to that is no we are the centrists okay that's the reality here we are the but you're you're a zealot centrist not, though but see no right there <laughs> is an answer here there is a better approach that we have thoughtful empirical financial evidence to show that this is for the goals that the vast majority of the population requires this is a better approach categorically better because ensembles diversification the explicit recognition of our ignorance understanding human motivations and that that will allow for that diversification you know you when you move away from that is when you start becoming more and more zealot so mike to your point when when everybody does what we're doing will i want to go and do something very different just because not me i have I like remember where I came from, what, why I decided to go in this space and be diversified and be terrified of, of an equity line that wasn't kind of slow, uh, low volatility and, and upward sloping. It was because of what had happened to my family and their wealth over and over again. Right. So there is a I think there is a truth. I think there I am not a zealot. I think I am, and, and what we are offering is the middle line. Says, says every zealot. And, and, I was about to say, if, the lady doth protest too much. The population doing this, I'm not, that, that's not my personality. I'm not going to be like, screw these guys. Now I'm going to go and do, I don't know, long volatility investing because I want to feel the pain of exclusion. For Christ's sake, guys. Yeah, this what do you this mean ties pain into of like, exclusion? yeah. This ties into the question in the no, comments about like Jordan. pain of exclusion. Yeah. Jordan said, you know, why don't I like Ben Hunt? And I just want to clarify that real quick. And this relates to what we're saying. It's like, as I don't dislike Ben Hunt, there's always option C. I can't stand people are like or dislike. I'm like, yeah. I'm ambivalent to Ben Hunt in the sense that like, I, that's just not my particular brand of narrative, right? Narratives about narratives and a meta narrative is like, it's not my fight club. I just don't care. And so like, but at the end of the day, like you're saying, we all have narratives, right? And to have a narrative, you're essentially a zealot. And you're saying like you even started using words like we have evidence, we have proof, like all these things where here's my question for you is like almost the opposite sense. Like you're, you're talking about things like, you know, we're here almost like the way Silicon Valley does is like we're here to save the world or improve the world. Like, are you really? Because there's a lot of like elitism and schadenfreude to like uh, wait for the comeuppance of the 6040 crowd because you're going to step in and crush their dreams. Like, so I, I worry about that. Or more importantly, to make a specific point on it, I know how you guys construct a portfolio. So like, let's address like, what if you're wrong? Like, if we're all saying there's this fourth turning and all this stuff's going on and we're about to experience this 70s or 40s style inflation, like, what if you're wrong? Okay, well, what if we are wrong about inflation? You tell me what happens to the way we constructed the portfolio. No, that's what I'm, I'm letting you. Okay. I'm let, uh, there was a softball. Oh, I, you're, oh, oh you're, I you're teeing me up. You know, here's what I want to do. So if, 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 this, this is all yeah, I, mean, I was ready to. I was ready to go. Adam, can are you we, still uh, there? Uh, You've been we, frozen for about half an hour because I yeah, do want you. Yeah, I don't know. Here. Am I actually frozen or am I just being still? You're, you're You've been frozen, frozen on and off. But I can, like, we can hear you. I actually yeah, like your yeah, to, to answer Jason's question is yes. If we're wrong, the point is that something else within the portfolio will benefit from. If there's low inflation, then we're going to have the opportunity to make money in bonds or make money in certain equities and, and be able to go long and short all the all the futures contracts that we trade. But with that said, right? So there's that, that's what I mean by being the centrist, being the middle line, not taking solitary in any single asset class in any direction. But to address the question of isn't everybody zealot in, the, in their own realm of expertise? I remember you wrote, Adam, a piece with uh, Michael Edison. Edison Ed, I responded was, to him, yeah. You responded to, 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 his, to a debate that you were having about, you know, empirical finance is BS. You know, the only thing you can do is buy, buy and hold or something like that because, you know, it's all fugazi, right? Turtles, turtles, turtles. So tell me, if you recall... Tell me a little bit about what your response to that was. To that um, view, that there's nothing that we can do. 
Well, I think, yeah, I mean, you either adopt a completely nihilist perspective and say that I have no control, I have no, I have no free will, you know, I mean, Jason and I can, and all of us, God, all Jesus, of us all of us can, 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 can jam on that for, for can, a very long time. Can we time. make nihilism great again? How did nihilism <laughs> become a pejorative? I just, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> So now we need that MNGA. Yeah, MNGA. Manga. Um, Make nihilism great again. Um, But, you know, I think we sort of have to act as if we have, we have free will. We, 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 we have decisions to make, right? Like not deciding on a portfolio allocation is a, is an allocation, right? Because your money sits in the bank or your money sits under the mattress. So we all are required to act. That was my point. So if you're going to act, then act in a way that is consistent with both some sort of comprehensive framework for how markets should operate and and how they should operate in response to the underlying economies or economic variables. And when when the theory or some sort of generalizable framework doesn't give you enough information to to um, to make a good decision, then you, you have to sort of lean on the data. And yeah, if you lean too heavily on the data, then you've got, you've got sample bias, right? We talk all the time about how many people use U historical U S equity returns and bond returns for the Monte Carlo models for retirement planning, et cetera. And how that is like, that's the lamppost problem. Because that data is available so readily and it has such a long history, everybody uses it, right? Um, but it's kind of like the drunk looking for their keys and a guy stumbles by and the drunk's by the lamppost and it's dark. And the guy's like, what's going on? The drunk's like, I lost my keys. And he, the, the passersby says, well, did you lose them here by the lamp? And the drunk says, no, but this is where the light is, right? It's exactly the same thing for U.S. um, stock and bond historical returns. So you're using these long-term data for your simulations and to draw conclusions, but you're not realizing that this is one sample and that if you were to use a much broader global sample that there are countries in the world that have, where their their stock markets and bond markets have been completely wiped out, that the global sample has very different distribution properties than the U.S. sample, right? But... Once you sort of recognize, I need to use data to help me make this, to guide this decision, of course, you need to like use as much data as possible, be as thoughtful as possible about the biases embedded in that data. But eventually, you need to be guided by the data. Because what else are you going to use? You're going to throw darts. I'm getting so excited. I'm getting so excited. Yes, please. So, all right, let's just start talking about this different way when you're talking about data. It's like, let's take the last 100 years, and more importantly, the last 140 years since the advent of the Industrial Revolution. We went from 1 billion people in the workforce to roughly 5 billion of the people in the, in the workforce. Are we likely to see that over the next few centuries? Absolutely not. So everybody goes, I want a long data set. So they show you 100 years of returns, and we pick apart that data, and we try to like create a portfolio around that data when that is literally one data point. And so hold no on, data. let me finish. No let data. me finish. It's it's no Human data motivations. in there. So two reasons. I, I think this is the difference. Maybe the, uh, you know, we, we, we all violently agree, let's be honest. But like yeah. this slight nuance is like, to me, it's like, I want to build the world's least shitty portfolio. I don't need data to do that. If I hold all the world's asset classes and I rebalance frequently, I'm going to hopefully do less shitty than everybody else over the long term. And yes, even rebalancing is a choice. And maybe there's data to that to shout out to Corey with uh, rebalancing luck. But no, that's no, no, a worry no. about. So just be careful. I thought you were going to say rebalancing premium. Let's not trigger. No, him. no, no, no. I don't want to trigger Corey on that premium, please. But part of that, like and, and to be very put to put a specific point on it. This was the, the question I was thinking about for Adam on my walk this morning. You know, there's nothing I hate more than somebody that comes on stage at like one of these financial conferences. And all they talk about is you know, uh, CPI, the basket's a piece of shit. Like there's no way to trust CPI. And then the next thing they start talking about is real rates. And I'm like, wait, what did, what did you subtract from? You subtract from CPI, (laughs) right, right. And then, so as you know, it's like, we start, we're in this conversation, we're talking about inflation is like seventies, like forties and people will back test CPI for a hundred years. But as you know, the basket for CPI has changed dramatically every decade of what we use for inputs. So if that's your, not just to the basket, but to the calculation methodology. If that's your data set for inflation, yeah. Like, what are we talking about? 
Okay. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and so I, I, again, right, of course, we all violently agree, right? But just to sort of reinforce, the idea behind our, the, the global risk parity core philosophy is let's not rely on historical data. Let's lean into a framework for portfolio resiliency. Are you relying in, on historical correlations though? No, no, not if, not if you're, you're not if you're I dynamically think you're thinking adjusting. About it for, for, that for dynamic adjusting is though, the dynamic adjusting is using a back a a a, 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 a reverse looking measure for adjusting your correlation. So that is using a data set and like that is using data to figure out how you're going to adjust correlations. So it is a, no, but it's, a it's contemporaneous it's a though, right? I mean, yeah, for sure. You've got to sort of make some assumptions about the fact that right. the, the correlation of the covariance structure is going to be persistent for, for, you know, so, some time that, that, that the recent right. past or the long-term average past or whatever look back you're going to use for, for, for portfolio construction is representative but there's also steps that you can take that you know any sensible quant would take to say well we don't want to just just take the the exact raw sample covariance right we want to we want to uh, we want to shrink that or make adjustments or whatever to it to to acknowledge the fact that this that the sample is not the population that there's uh potential liquidity events or, or other types of situations waiting in the wings that could cause correlations to move in a very different way than, than what is um, revealed from the historical sample. Like this, Absolutely. The idea here is, look, the empirical ob observed reality is not the, it's not the territory, right? It's the map. But since we don't have any other guide to rely on and we have decisions to make, this is the least bad decision. It's the decision that has the least amount of bias. There's no way to eliminate bias, but this is the decision that eliminates the most bias. Yeah. As We're still father, making assumptions, but it's the, the least number. As my of father used to say, I, operations research was his master's degree. And he said, operations research is a statistical approach that allows you to answer questions poorly that would otherwise be answered even worse, right? That's what this is all about. And, and I do reject the fact that it's all based on data and that we hope the correlations continue. There is, again, and going back to human motivations, and if we go to, back to redactio et absurdum, when we, let's assume that every single asset class just becomes the same thing and they move up and down together, what would have to happen for every single asset class that goes from moving up and down together in the identical way to start stop moving up and down together. What motivations in different sectors and different economies would then force an asset class to deviate and why? Why is gold different than, than stocks? Why are stocks different than sovereign bonds and so on? So there is an underlying first principles. I know you love that word, Jason. First principles reality. What is first principles? Is first principles really real? Well, yeah. matrix action, but the, 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 but we have to anchor to some sort of lived experience, reality, understanding how human beings work, and then based on that, you can create a model, right? That is poorly answered, but better than most. And I also I was listening to Ricky Gervais be interviewed by uh, Stephen Colbert. The best, the best. And one of his questions was, you know, how do you know that the Bible isn't real or that God isn't real? And he's like, Let, let's just do this, okay? This is why I lean on science. I lean on science because if we were to erase the memories of every human being on the planet and we had, you know, we're all going to do it. We're all humans. We're going to rewrite those books, right? We're going to rewrite the Quran. We're going to rewrite the Bible. That, those books will be different, vastly different than the ones that we have written thus far. But the observed reality of our existence via science the materials reality, how the world works, will will come to the exact same answers, right? And so, from the, doing the drawing the parallelism to zealotry in the world of finance, we see a lot of people make a lot of money making predictions about the second coming of the NFTs or the second coming of gold, right? These are that's zealotry. That's a story. That's a narrative based on very little observable evidence versus what we're trying to accomplish, which is using scientific method, first principle thinking, creating a framework by which if our memories got erased and we came back at it again, 
the zealot narrative of any asset class will be different, but the scientific method that we've taken to come up with our conclusions of portfolio construction will likely all converge again. Right, but that's it, the difference. That's why you, you can be, you can lean on science, dude. You just dog whistled Jason on like yeah. three different topics. Yeah. So <laughs> no, no. It's, it's fine. Like, but yeah, if you if you say first principles for a third time, I am gonna my head's gonna explode. <laughs> but, yeah, gonna but, but 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 I want to point out some specific. I mean, you guys know your Kuhn and Popper that like there's only two types of scientific theories. Ones that been disproven, those ones yet to be disproven. And I know Mike and I are 20 years older than both of you guys, but like we've all seen a lot of shit happen that we didn't expect to happen. Right? Everything we thought was a a, a, a foundational first principle bedrock of investing has gone the opposite way that we thought it went. But also like, I'm, I, I'm just curious, like I, I wanted to bring it back to my, I, actually my question for Adam is like, I'm curious, like when you guys run, like you guys did some, you guys done these great charts for a hundred years that I, I, quite frankly, I love that show like what are real returns, but I'm curious like how you, how you settle it in your mind of figuring out what that inflation rate as an inflation basket changes for the last hundred years and how appropriate is that to figure out real returns? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying like, I'm wondering uh, how, how you start thinking through that when you guys are building charts like that. No, I mean, I, do, I think, look, really the, rea the reality is everything is illustrative, right? Yeah. Like, yes, of course, we don't have a Intuition good... pumps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like we, it's, it, yes. we're, not, we're not making any sort of precise claims about exactly what the real returns have, have been or you know, exactly what inflation looked like or even what asset prices look like. You know, the, there's been revisionist history in asset prices too. So there's the, the point of, of charts and papers and, and statements like that are, again, to sort of jar people out of their, um, their, the reverie that they, that they, they get hypnotized by the shit in the Wall Street Journal and Barron's and CNBC and et cetera. And just to sort of point out you're living in a, in a, in a dream state, right? Or like you're living in a dream state that, that, that differs from reality by more than the dream, the dream state that I'm pitching, <laughs> right? Like, like they, they're, they're all filtered through our, our perceptual faculties and they're, none of it, it, it's all map. There's no territory, but, but the map that I've got is, a, is, a, is a, is a more, is, is closer to reality than the map that, that you're operating um, on. And I, you know, I, I don't want to say that there's a hill over there and you need to go take it, but, but there are hills. There's no hills on your map. There's hills yeah. on my map. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, some, you should be prepared to take hills from time to time. Right. That, that's basically the, the it's, it's almost like, it, it's like meta zealotry, right? Like it's not, it's not zealotry about any particular, um, view about how how markets should operate and more a um a, a meta zealotry on i don't have strong views on how markets operate so i want to spread my bets to the greatest extent possible yeah it's like a via you know? negativa zealotry and i think I've, I've talked to like all you guys individually about this but what i'm bringing up like more specifically is like because i struggle with this all the time so i'm, I'm really at the end of the day you know I'm, I'm talking about the voices inside my own head but it's like when you know you only have like an hour to talk to a potential client right you're going to simplify all the things we all talk about um that we thought about when constructing portfolios the way we look at back tests all of those things and yep. the hard part i find in my own mind is like like you said if i keep using this example if you do a hundred year back test and you're overlaying real returns because you're using cpi and you go to put that out. I know in the back of your head and all your guys' heads, there's like, well, that's not exactly right. You know, that there's a there's a caveat and nuance there. But like if we start talking about caveats and nuance, we start pulling on those threads. We're going to be here for three days trying to talk to clients. And to me, it's a, it's a conundrum that I'm trying to illuminate just my own stressors about like trying to simplify so you get your point across to that potential client versus accuracy of what you know is even falsifiable about the information you're you're currently saying so you have this like dichotomy inside your own mind where the voices are yelling at each other while you're just trying to simplify and get your point across but then you know that like it's not quite that simple yeah but there's dissonance everywhere and i mean yeah. the reality is most clients don't they're not interested they don't want to you know dig into the details some do there are clients right like our clients tend to be those people that like to read research, watch videos, read white papers, et cetera, right? But most most people just don't. And then like at a more abstract level, 
I think most people have a really hard time grasping, you know, concepts like what we've lived is one, one history, one timeline out of a multitude of potential timelines. You know, history could have gone very, very differently based on a very small number of what might seeming what, what might seem like extremely minor changes to, you know, uh, to dynamics along the way, right? And so we shouldn't we we shouldn't think that we can learn more from history, the history that actually manifested. Um, then we actually can, right? Because there's just so much randomness in, in, in all of these outcomes, right? But pe most people are, are uncomfortable with that. They haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it and sort of trying to inject conversations with, with that level of, of sort of historical humility or understanding of the stochastic nature of, of life at the universe is, is, <laughs> is usually counterproductive to people making decisions, right? And the more we have, the more we try to go down those rabbit holes, the, the less likely people are to make decisions that are in their best interest. That's right. <laughs> I mean, with Adam, it's like the amount of caveats, you know, he makes a statement and he's like, well, let me, unless, just let me back yeah. up for a second because I <laughs> yeah, can yeah, see yeah. three scenarios by which exactly. this doesn't happen. And so half an hour goes by and you still haven't gotten the answer from him, right? So over the last 10 years, we've coached Adam to stop being so precise and more be broadly correct, right? Especially when you're communicating for the first time with somebody that, that requires your help. I mean, this is where the fiduciary discussion comes in, right? If you are an advisor and clients are coming to you, this is the behavioral side where you have to talk about Mike's skis and bikes, right? That, that, yep. that analogy is, is, is broadly correct, but it also misses many of the points that we want to get to, right? But it's enough. It's enough to get them to, be, to say yes. And you as a fiduciary have the responsibility to do the right things that require the minutia and the deep understanding. But you've, you've made them move in the right direction. And if they're interested, they'll go to the next level and the next level. And that's what one hopes over time, right? right. Wait, but, wait, did Mike to come up with skis and bikes? Mike did, I think. I'm just learning yeah. this right now, Mike. Did, Rodrigo's yeah. always taking credit for that in my mind whenever I bring <laughs> I up know, how no. great Let me how great you have given here. me credit and I have said nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't refute it. Yeah. <laughs> skis, and, skis and bikes is one of my favorite papers of all time because it says exactly what we're talking about very simply like what if you're wrong right and that that's the beauty of skis and bike is proper diversification but yeah, note that that also comes from a first principles perspective that's four <laughs> um right <laughs> like if you say to a person from an intuitive perspective do you want a ski company or do you want a bike company they'll say well both obviously why obviously? Because there's fundamental reasons why you want to have cash flows both in the summer and the winter, right? Yeah. It's just a, a beautiful, super simple. There's Rodrigo diminishing Mike's wisdom and insight there. Exactly. Right? Like any, <laughs> any, anybody could come up with, with this trivial <laughs> metaphor that that so perfectly captures the the the, the value of, of diversification rebalancing. That yeah. Like I've it. got a, I've got a couple of other questions for you guys. One is I want to bring up because we were. Wait, who's interviewing who here? What the no, I, 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 do, I, I do, I do, yeah. I do like the questions, but I do want to make sure we get a chance to talk about some of the stuff that you're doing too, Jason. Who gives a I, shit? What about what I do? I like do. You, I, I've just, I've, I've alienated any potential customer with this, with this call anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, with this, with this show. But I want to go because this, this agnosticism. I think we all have a, a deep love for maybe like commodity trend following because of the agnosticism of like that kind of strategy. And I was just like kind of pulling up positions today it's been interesting like you guys are seeing we're still like a lot of long en energy but I'm, i don't know about you guys like how many different punches of look backs you run but it's interesting to see that like to me like the the shorter time frames are starting to take profits on that long energy position i mean they're short bonds everywhere um you know metals are flat grains are mixed because that's the beauty of all this diversification but what i want to bring up with that i thought i was curious and this is what's great about trend following is like your rational mind sometimes can't comprehend a lot of the positions is like i'm seeing things like long FTSE and hang sang which i have no idea why it's just curious right but then there's like things like long brazilian real and long mexican peso but you so you go oh maybe that's a commodity play but at the same time we've seen sh short cad and no position on the aussie dollar so it's like what the fuck like, but that's kind of the joy of, of, of watching a trend following program. I well, mean, it doesn't require you, an you error. You dream of those types of dynamics in your trend following right. portfolio, right? Oh, yeah. the, the worst 
times in trend following is when all of your positions are on the same side of the trampoline, right? Like, so, you know, you're, you've got your energies on, you've got your, your coppers on, you're, you're, you're long, all the commodity currencies, your short bonds, your, your short long duration equities, right? Those are terrifying periods because, you know, if any sort of corrective action, you're going to be severely punished. But, you know, the, the great thing about, and, and I, I do think that a lot of kind of pure trend strategies are still a little bit um, heavily concentrated on the on the inflation trade at the moment. Um, certainly, I mean, our largest position, I think, is short copper and has been for for a couple of weeks. Wow. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe three or four weeks, um, which is definitely a, a, a difference from. And, and by the way, I'm, when I say our large, that's like for our active <laughs> sleeves, right? Not not for the core uh, sleeves, but. Um, so I love it when you've got a situation where you've got, you know, one commodity currency, you're long, one commodity currency, you're short. You got a couple long energies, a couple of short energies, you know, or your long energies and your short metals that like this type of balance, I think is where you can more easily sleep at night as an active manager, because again, you've got sort of diversity of bets. But I want to come back to what you said. You keep saying commodity trend. What the fuck is commodity trend? Okay. That's not a thing. Okay. Yeah. There's diversified trend following. There's no, what is, right? We're, we're, you need to trade all of the commodities, <laughs> equity indices, bond indices. Yeah, currencies. I agree with you. This is my fucking dog whistle, right? So there's no, no. <laughs> yeah. such thing as commodity trend. It's just like diversified global, global trend. Yeah. I, I think, well, I just use it because of CTA and then because of Chris Cole, but also like you said, like, yeah, we, we try to find managers that trade at least 40% commodities, but as you know, that can be across the board, but like, I've always argued you actually, like you said, you want rates, you want FX, you want the indices, you want bonds because like all of those things, like the short bond position right now is crushing it. And everybody didn't think they could make money on short bonds. Like, so it, yeah, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you. But like, once again, I think, well, the worst part is like what you're hinting at is like, what is it? Is it ZTA? Is it trend following? Is it commodity trend following? Is it managed futures? Is it uh, crisis alpha? They have a terrible naming convention. No, They've always agree, been terrible sure. about marketing that that general that general product, and that's and all, that's kind of always the problem. And also the fact that you you talk about futures and everybody's like, yeah, that trend factor. Why? Yeah, it's such a weird universe to to have been given. You say managed futures CTA, whatever you want, it it's always trend. And I tweeted today, it's like the equivalent of saying, oh, you invest in the S&P 500, but you're a value manager, right? You invest in yeah. those stocks and that pool of stocks, you must be value. No, there's growth managers, there's quality, there's you know a wide variety of styles. And yeah. the same applies in the future space. And I, we got to find, I either want to take back managed futures and, and remind people that everybody's different. That when they talk about the dispersion and CTA trend, it's because they're not all trend. Like we right. barely have it. Like we have, we have a trend, a large portion of trend, but seasonality, we have, uh, you know, carry, um, mean reversion, um, uh, relative value, relative value, right? Ball. Ball. Like it's a, why these are different styles and why do we pigeonhole every managed futures manager to be in a trend manager when what you actually want is continue to, to expand that diversification away from the sim, a single trend manager, which for 10 three years has been. A, like a lot of pain, right? Not yeah, necessarily a losing a lot of money, but it's been like low single digits, right? So yeah, but come yeah, on, if you no. return stack that two percent Kager, I know that's know, why you, I had to stop myself. <laughs> I, 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 There's I, always a caveat, stack right? That two percent. What about return stacking eight though? right? Because you diversified yeah. away from trend. Yeah. So I yeah. just, you know, people need to wake up to the fact that there's many different ways to skin the managed futures cat, and I'm taking managed futures back. I managed to ask me what type of managed futures manager I am rather than, oh, yeah, how's trend done this this decade? That's yeah. what I'm that's what I'm after these days. Well, this is this is great for you guys that, you know, I, all you guys put on your tinfoil hats or your salad bowls and, you know, figure out like what how do you would you change the marketing of that entire industry? And we can all go after that together. But like it, I think it's the convention is that the majority are trend followers. And so that's yeah. why it always gets labeled that way. But like you said, futures is just an asset class. It's not a strategy and, and, and not even, it's not even just an asset class. There's millions of instruments underneath there. And I think, Adam, what's your quote that there's at least 17 uncorrelated return streams? In futures, yeah, I mean it depends right? on, yeah, but, but, yeah, certainly over the very long term, on average, there's kind of 13, well, 14. To be 13 years, futures, futures is just a, a, a construction of a certain vehicle, 
yeah that rep represents an underlying like that it's sort of like the etf if we're going to put it you know go backwards a little bit it's just an yeah it's a structure it it's not it's a, a structure it's not really yeah. anything it can represent many things rates uh -huh. and this way i was asking about um time tranching because i'm curious like i've had arguments on twitter about a lot of trend followers will argue that they're almost like a long gamma position or I hate when people break everything down to options like they're replicating a straddle. It's like maybe in the 1970s when they'd add to positions. But the way maybe you can do it now is by time tranching. If you have short term, medium term, long term lookbacks and you're slowly adding to that position, maybe that's a way of getting more of that long gamma kind of convexity out of that position as you're adding to it over time as the different tranching of lookbacks kick in. I'm just curious of what you guys' take on that is. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think that. I think for 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 you to really get expect positive gamma from trend strategies, then you have to simultaneously expect that that whenever you enter a position, the vol of that position is expanding. Right. Um, so you know, which which is demonstrably true in in some instruments at at, at certain times, but. Um, you know, we certainly can't make that as a generalizable statement. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, the the, the returns are are, well, are the the convex, vector of the return has they, to be right too, though, because at the turn, trend following sucks for sure. For sure, and the, 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 the vector the of the sucks. return is related to that the expansion of the return going the wrong way on you. Yeah. Well, that's that's exactly what that 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 ridiculous thumbnail we had for our show today was like our our commodities the new spacs because like you're saying like it's interesting is like the deeper you are in that trade the more profits you have on paper it almost becomes a left tail or left skewed trade which is the irony yeah. is like you put on the trade it's right skewed and hopefully yeah. convex and it has a little bit of a gamma component to it um, but as it, 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 the more profits you make the more that becomes a left skewed trade but that's that's the rub of of trading trend following you know so that's. It's always an interesting dichotomy to me is like, it's just nothing's ever, once again, there's nuance, right? Nuance are turtles all the way down, Rod. Turtles all the yeah. way down. So, so you know, let's let's shift a little bit because I want to get, I, I've yeah. actually been meaning to ask you about volatility and, and, and volatility yeah. managers specifically this year because, you know, let's talk about the narrative. The narrative has been, we had a big vol event in yeah. March, 2020. Everybody wanted tail, just like after a wait, everybody wanted the team to Lebs Black Swan Protection Protocol, right? Um, and you know, in their minds, individuals thought bear market plus tail equals solving all my problems. And it hasn't been that way this year. I mean, obviously, why the cockroach portfolio also included trend. I think you came to terms with that. That's needed specifically yeah. for these type of markets, but. Why isn't uh, volatility done well uh, in what may seem to most an ideal time for them? Long ball. No, that's or a great question. Uh, maybe, maybe that's a question. Can, yeah. Maybe you can tell me about all the balls. Yeah, no, I'll talk about like different strategies and everything and how the outlook has been so far this year. But like, I also want to address what kind of Mike said earlier that I thought was great when he was like, let's, and I appreciate you, like, let's talk about what you guys do and cockroach and everything. But like, it, it revolves around everything we're saying is like, you either like, people buy from people, right? And all the nonsense I'm speaking on here, it either drives with you or not. So like, then you'll find out like what I do for a living. But otherwise, like if you don't like, you know, the cut of my jib or the way I represent myself, like people buy from people. So like you understand, if you understand the craziness of my brain, then you might understand the craziness of our portfolio construction. And so that's why it's like, it, there's a there's a first, prin first principle idea to that. But so the idea with volatility this year and people are like, why isn't volatility paid off when we're in such a drawdown in the S&P? And the way I have always thought about it, and I know you got, we've all talked about this a lot, is like, you know, whether there's uncorrelated return streams for managed futures or futures, like like Adam saying 13 uncorrelated streams, or like when Ray Dalio was talking about, you want to look for like 16 different uncorrelated return streams. At the end of the day, there's really just three correlations, right? It's either correlated, uncorrelated, or negatively correlated. And that's the whole point. It's like everything's correlated with equity beta, you know, you're your equity, your bonds, your VC, your PE, in a liquidity cascade or a VAR event, everything, those correlations go to one, right? The commodity trend strategies, by the very nature of the way they trade, is an uncorrelated strategy. And then you can structure negatively correlated strategies with like tail risk put solutions or, or long volatility. And so the point of why we always thought about long volatility is like for you to go to an environment from like a, a risk on environment where like 60, 40 is doing great to a, an environment where like commodity trends doing great, you're usually going to have a violent uh, liquidity event. And so that's what you really need, like tail risk protection for that or long volatility. It's for those really sharp sell offs when everything's crashing, 
correlations go to one. Everybody's throwing out the baby with the bathwater because everybody's going to cash. And we find out who's swimming naked. Is those are the times you want that convex cash position. And then you can rebalance and reload back to whether it's 60 40 is going to have a rebound or the commodity trend's really going to take off. So it's really that's the true crisis alpha in those, um, those, those endogenous liquidity events. Um, and then it usually takes a little bit longer for like a trend following to really uh, take off like it's done for the last 12 months. So it's, it's those different pieces and parts of the portfolio. So what's happened this year is if your long volatility and the uh, implied volatility or the expectation of volatility is at a certain level, but the market just drips lower and lower every day below that expectations of 30 day forward variance, then you're not going to see a pickup in volatility. So if you're trading long volatility, you're already paying a high price and the, and the market is not jumping past that implied price. And so therefore it's very hard or a headwind to long volatility because it's the price you pay. Like everybody wants to look at VIX, but VIX index is non-tradable. It doesn't really matter at all. It's the price you pay for those options. And so if the price you pay is skewed higher, you need the market to exceed that expectation for you to make money. It's everything in life, right? You need it to exceed the, the incumbent like expectation. And so that's why a lot of long volatility strategies have had a, a rough go or a headwind this year. But certain volatility strategies actually have done well, like dispersion trading has been very well this year. Um, and the, once again, this is not investment advice and that could change tomorrow. But I'm just saying historically from the beginning of, of 2022, dispersion trading is doing well. Um, gamma scalping is doing well because we've had a lot of intraday volatility that's not really showing up to close to close the volatility. Um, and then the third one that seems to be doing well is much kind of really super long dated, like seven to 10 year leaps that you can only get. Um, in OTC contracts or ISDA contracts um, across cross asset volatility. So not just equity vol. If you're over in rates vol or FX vol and you have a, these longer term trades, um, those have done fairly well this year. So as much as like equity vol has this really high um, kind of headwind or, or, you know, to it where it's very difficult to really make money in equity vol. If you're using cross asset vol, that tends to do well. But then also if you're if you're kind of really trading that on an intraday basis with gamma scalping, that, that has done well as well. So that's the that's the difficulty, and then and then talking about dispersion. Just so everybody knows, dispersion is like short index vol, long single name vol. Um, that that has done well this year, but dispersion can trade on like can turn on a dime on you, and you can get your face ripped off. So part of your philosophy with the mutiny fund is is really leaning into this fact that we have no idea exactly how risk is going to manifest, and so. We want to have hedges against a variety of different ways that risk might manifest, both different different speeds, uh, different magnitudes, and right. also manifesting in different areas of the market. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think I think again, just sort of illustrating how we we, we are sort of really thinking alike in terms of of trying to be humble about having too active a view about the, the types of things, either the opportunities that we're going after or the risks that we're trying to hedge, right? Like, in, in more of a, I don't know what's coming. I want to be prepared for as many things as I can imagine without acknowledging that there are things that could happen that I cannot or do not imagine, right? And so I'm going to mix a bunch of stuff. But, but correct me if I'm wrong, you've also got like, some short-term trend type strategies in that yep. fund alongside some, some option stuff. And so those have probably been paying off nicely while the option stuff has kind of been um, whistling past the graveyard a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So like we, we believe, like you're saying perfectly, we believe in diversifying or diversifier. So even how I was saying it was like uh, dispersion is done well or gamma scalping and especially gamma scalping and like long dated cross asset ball has done really well in 2022, but they were terrible in Q4 of 2021. Those right. were like the actual drawdown. So it's like it's diversifying those diversifiers because the sell-off has so many path dependencies. And what you're saying that was great is like not only do we use long volatility tail solutions, we also use um, intraday trend following, which is exceedingly hard. Most people think it can't right. be done, but they they trade on those market indices so they can take that delta one position. So right now, why volatility has that headwind is because you're paying out for that implied volatility. But if you're directionally shorting those market indices with those delta one futures instruments, then you can you don't have to pay up for that implied volatility, but you have the time your directional trade right so yeah that's another way that we think about ballasting that portfolio is like you have different ways of playing this you can use volatility relative value you can use long volatility which is just opportunistically trade the tails you can use classical tail risk solutions like rolling puts or put spreads um, if you want to diversify that way 
Or you can use this intraday trend following where you're just shorting those market industries around the world and not just the U.S. markets as, as a lot of literature is starting to come out in the last decade or especially since uh, March of um, 2020 is the overnight has been where all the action is. So if people are just trading those U.S. indexes, like they might not be able to capture that move. So we look for managers that come to trade Europe and Asia. So you almost have that like they're either they're trading those markets individually or they can capture that relay race when we go fully off risk off. So like those, and then, so it's that diversifying your diversifiers. Cause once again, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic about everything in life. And so we don't really know what's going to happen, especially if it's a unique path dependency. And let's say it only happens every seven, 10, 12 years, you better make sure you capture the meat of that move. And so that's why I, 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 I can't take idiosyncratic risk with that. I don't have a hero trade that I think is going to pay off and this specific path dependency is going to happen. You know, it's that diversifying your diversifiers to make sure you do, you have the best chance at capturing that move. Yeah, and Cockroach takes the same philosophy and just sort of expands on it, right? So yep. you've got that kind of tail hedge element to it, but then you've got other um, other sleeves or facets to the portfolio that are designed to do better in um, a variety of other types of environments. So yeah. I would love for you to sort of, are, anything sort of stand out either as lessons learned from running this in, in live trading or or and or... Um, you know, what, what has impacted the cockroach strategy, um, notably over the past 12 months or so. Cause it's been crawling along nicely. Exactly <laughs> nice work. N nice work there. Um, so yeah, so just to reiterate that the idea with cockroach is like, I almost said earlier, is like, it's a total portfolio solution is like, if we hold the world's asset classes and rebalance, hopefully we'll be okay. So it's global stocks, global bonds. Our long volatility ensemble that we just talked about. We also run an ensemble of, of trend following. Um, I'm trying to pick my words carefully because I don't want to get mad, Adam mad about commodity trend following, et cetera. And Thank then we you. also hold Appreciate as like at fiat hedges, we hold, hold gold and a little bit of cryptocurrency. Um, so have things surprised me or what have I learned over especially the last year? By the way, we just we only launched Cockroach in September of 21. Um, but it was just like the exactly things I was saying about it. It's like if you have a long uh, protracted slow drawdown like we've seen or what happened in 2008 those are the times you need trend following more than you need long volatility right you need long volatility in march 2020 but you need trend following in like 2022 or in 2008 mm -hmm. so this is like you know putting that portfolio together that's what we're thinking about um i might be wrong about this so you guys might have pushback i know i actually went rodrigo is one of the first people i actually ran this by is like in a risk on environment over long periods of time there's only literally two asset classes it's like equity and debt right? Whether it's stocks, bonds, we can say PE or all these leveraged versions of like equity and debt is how we make money over long cycles. And then when those don't make money, they tend to crash pretty quickly. And so therefore we think about maybe long volatility offsets that equity risk. And then your, your trend following offsets that debt or credit risk with, with treasuries, you know, corporate bonds, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's a way of looking at it. It's like, you really want to just ride that that stock bond portfolio for most risk on cycles but then to have those hedges for risk off so then you repurchase at lower nav points through rebalancing um i may be oversimplifying or overly stretching a metaphor but i'm curious like if you guys have any like pushback to that or like what a way i think about it is like you have linear instruments with stocks and bonds and then you have convex instruments with long volatility and trend following and those kind of they offset in unique ways where you think they would just zero each other out but no, if you take linear instruments and you overlay those with convex instruments and they can jump out from behind the curtain and help you when you need them most, that's kind of the tend of the way we think about it. Yeah, I think there's merit to that. Um, I've actually I mean, never, never thought of framing it in that regard. It, it makes sense to me. Yeah. That's well, yes. an extra if Mike's never thought about it, I'm onto something. Yeah, that's true. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But the, yeah, you've got sort of growth inflation and then you've got this yeah. kind of crisis um, dimension, which requires, um, you know, in crisis, vol expands, right? And right. so you want, you want a sleeve of the portfolio where vol expands commensurately with the vol that's expanding in your sort of stock and bond exposures. Uh, but, but it, it at least has the potential to be expanding in a direction that offsets the vol expansion in your, in your core, uh, exposures, right? Um, so well, I, I like the, the framing of how it sort of jumps out from behind the curtain in, in a couple of ways, right? One is that 
generally investors can't handle those strategies. So they need to be behind the curtain. They need to be close. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. They can't and, take and that line that, of risk. The, yeah. Correct. And that's that's the sort of magic of that sort of description and narrative that I, I really like. It, it's yes, we need to keep them behind the curtain. They're gonna, they're gonna they're, they come out when Hark, I hear a cannon, they'll jump on stage and they'll they'll do their two second act and then they'll be back behind the curtain again because we can't literally take the line item risk, as you said. So that's uh, a great way to think about it. And then our, our our active part of it, so to speak, is that like monthly rebalancing. And that's a, I wish we could rebalance maybe differently in tranches and everything, or even quarterly, depending on the asset class. But like, it's a function of just how we how we all run our businesses. Like if you have monthly inflows and outflows, you rebalance on a monthly basis. So this is like, I'm saying holding all the world's asset classes and rebalancing monthly. And you know, Rod, you didn't get the last one. So once again, I'm teeing you up here. So the, when, you know, we were on our quarterly call recently and one of the things I brought up that I, I think I heard audible groans was like, I'm so happy when we're rebalancing, we're buying bonds here. Like, do I think bonds are coming? And like, I don't care, but like eventually they are going to. And the whole point of a properly diversified portfolio is you are going to hate one of the asset classes as much as people hate bonds right now, as much as hate people hate crypto this month is like, that is the entire point of a properly diversified portfolio. Part of it should make you want to throw up on yourself. Well, look, you saw in a risk parity framework, right, where you had to, you have to rebalance back into your commodity positions. I don't think people have seen the commodity equity line from 2011 to 2020, but it went as low as like 75 percent and had that period in 2013, 2014 was a 50 percent drawdown month after month after month. And if you're doing a monthly rebalancing and you were happy about buying commodities at this level. Yeah. And then you said it to yourself again and again and again. It's just not true. Like, it's not necessarily true. And they, this is it going back again to what they're used to, right? They've seen a dip. Of course, it's going to go back. Mean reversion exists all the time. And mean reversion exists until it doesn't for a long period of time, right? The key is in not caring and having everything else be offset. And you're going to harvest enough mean reversion over time to have a diversification slash rebalancing premium. Um, so it all goes back to this level of humility, right? This this um, attacking the the investment equation from a place of I don't know, and so let's uh, be mechanical, let's be diversified. Isn't, isn't it also a, a function of liquidity transport, right? You're taking yeah. uh, liquidity from one market where it's robust and moving it to another market that might be less robust. Yeah, uh, was it? Um... Not maybe Myron Schultz, he talked about Omega, right? Like if people talk about Alpha and Beta and, you know, the, the Chicago school doesn't believe in that. So they said Omega would be risk transfer services. That's what you get paid for is liquidity is another way of saying inventory and liquidity is a risk transfer service. Mm. So Omega is actually the only only way to actually have derive Alpha. Um, but I'm curious, like how you guys think about this is like with balancing, um, you know, I always think about a scale trading the equity curve. Like I think about uh, way back in the day when I first found about trend following decades ago, I was like, why wouldn't you scale into their equity curve, right? As trend followers, if you believe in the strategy, believe in the manager, and when they're in drawdown, why wouldn't you be scaling into that equity curve and scaling out at new highs? And like, that's gonna smooth out your equity curve. So it's like scale trading the actual equity curve of the strategy. So when you have this broad diversification across asset classes and you're rebalancing, you're scale trading those asset classes. But as Rod just referenced is, your the implicit assumption is mean reversion right and this is what i'm really curious about it's like everybody says well you know and mean reversion can happen over long stretches of time across asset classes but sometimes asset classes trend and that's when you don't want to be rebalancing but i i'm not so certain of that and what i mean by that is like by rebalancing even if it is in trend it's not as beneficial as a mean reversion environment but when it's in trend you're still monetizing the trend and you're taking from your winners and giving to your losers so like even though it's trending, it's not it's not perfect for rebalancing. You'd prefer mean reversion. But I'm curious about like to me, it's like micro monetizing the trend, though, when things are trending, though, too. So like you're actually gaining profits where if you just let those trends go and you weren't rebalancing, you know, like we're saying, like now you may be in a left skew kind of trade. Is that sort of like value averaging? You know, it sounds to me a little bit like the, the concept of uh, the, the value averaging concept. Uh, remember the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The retirement, the retirement yeah, scheme, yeah, yeah. the retirement accumulation um, strategy. Yeah, I, I just, I, I do wonder whether the rebalancing, let's call it the diversification premium. So, so Corey doesn't come through the screen. It is here. He's but, gone now. He's bored. He's out. Um, yeah. Or let's you know, Omega, back. whatever. Um, 
I don't know that that the assumption is mean reversion so much as the assumption is you have um, you have two uncorrelated assets, and over time, I mean, I know you, I, I know Shannon Zeman. You could theoretically have two um, two variables that are sufficiently um, uncorrelated or negatively correlated with sufficient volatility to be able to generate a positive omega, even if both of the variables have a negative expectancy. Mm -hmm. But in, in real life, the right. the, the, the high, high enough variance will overcome the, the probability that you're going to generate positive growth on two ultra high variance markets. And so like, I think the reality is in, in, in investing, you've got markets that are either expected to just be kind of random brownie in motion with zero drift or so like, let's say commodities um, in real terms. Um, or you're you're going to own a large variety of instruments that all have positive drift, and you're you're rebalancing between them in order to maintain an optimal di diversified portfolio. In other words, you're you're diversifying to to the greatest extent possible to minimize variance drag, and so you need to diversify. You need to rebalance in order to preserve optimal diversification. Define why variance drag is a variance. bad thing, just quickly, just in case. Well, it's the idea of like, just to keep it simple, if you've got a market that goes up by 50% and then down by 50%, you're not at zero, right? You're, you're, you're at some number below below zero. And it's because the compounding effect of, of gains is different um, than, than losses, right? So um, if you've got... If you've got an asset that moves from A to B in a in a straight line up with no with no variance, oh, Jesus, I don't know how you how you describe this in a Look, way. Look, the simple thing. Well, it's, it's simple. Yeah, the simple thing is, simple is if you go up fifty percent, you're at one hundred and fifty dollars. You go down fifty yeah, percent from there, you're at seventy five. Yeah. Exactly. But That's the other thing is just drag. like if you just want exactly. to the, the the mathematical entity is your arithmetic return minus your uh, half your variance, half right? Your variance. So yeah. that's what you're actually going to have in your pocket as a compound rate of return. So the more your variance, the lower your actual geometric return versus the arithmetic return. So the more variance, variance bad, diversification good, diversification but, okay. minimize variance. There's you want to capture out, the maximum amount of drift. Yeah, yeah there is yeah. variance while there's minimizing sure. while, while while minimizing total portfolio variance. There's exactly. there's two pieces or caveats that I find so fascinating. One is if you cannot know a priori how certain asset asset class return drivers are they going to be mean reverting or trending. If you can't know that for certain, I still want to rebalance, right? Like that's what I'm saying because like you're if they're mean reverting, you're going to take even better advantage of it. Or if they're trending, like I said, you're still monetizing the trend and, until they mean revert. Um, but then the piece, though, that the real caveat with what Rodrigo said about volatility bad, what's really interesting, volatility bad in single asset class. But if you can get your correlations right, like volatility great in multiple asset class, because then it reduces portfolio vol. And I think assuming that is that really hard for people to wrap their heads around. Yeah. Assuming they're uncorrelated or negatively correlated or it's constructed properly and that your yeah. your your priors are correct. It's really interesting to think that you actually want to pair highly volatile asset classes to reduce portfolio vol. Yep. And like, so like, right. like people would say like, I want to reduce bonds duration down to maybe like two years, five years or 10 years. And it's like, no, if you constructed that classic risk parity or permanent portfolio, you actually want the 30 year like TLT, you want the ultra bond because you actually want that volatility to really offset the rest of the portfolio. Well, no, but I mean, the, yeah, that, the idea here is that you want to right? own the two year with enough leverage that it gives you, you know, the same volatility as the 30 year. And then you're going to maximize diversification across all the different markets. And, you know, you, you don't you don't really care what the ambient ball of the underlying is because you could scale the, the ball to target whatever you want. But the idea is you need to scale vol in an optimal way so that you're maximizing the uh, your ability to harvest drift with the minimum amount of variance. What, what the, the, the language I like to use is that you're trying to maximize the asset class's true personality, right? If, 
if like the two year goes up yeah. when equities go down in, in a benign inflation environment, but it only goes up one unit when equities are going down four units, then it's it's got a personality. It goes up when equities go down in a benign inflation environment. How do we ma how do we equalize the impact of that personality? And that's if you have the ability to scale those asset classes to the same level of risk. Now you're allowing that balance to really provide that a lot of volatility, equal volatility, uh, creates a portfolio with the minimum volatility drag. You know what I mean? This is, and that concept is complicated. Happening every day. You know, we have products that are at 15 to 20 vol, 10 to 15 vol, 8 vol, and trying to explain why would I ever use that, that 15 to 20 vol? It seems so scary. The drawdowns are so large is because you'll actually allow an allocation into that big one will allow that allocation to maximize our personality. Otherwise, you're you're muting, and it's just a nice line item to look at, right? So look at that one line item. It doesn't. It's not so volatile. It didn't lose as much or made some money. You actually Until want you need to it. have your yeah. diversifier <laughs> to be like, oh my god, that one's up thirty. That's what you want. That's good volatility, right? So, so here's my yeah, here's my the line item risk. So bringing it back to like pragmatism or practicality is like here's what I want to know from you guys. How do I fractionalize? your guys' houses that you own in Grand Cayman. I want a fractional exposure to that, but I also want a fractional exposure to Toronto real estate. And you know, as your end of the world trade here, being on an island explodes and Toronto real estate collapses, how can I be rebalancing between the two in a fractionalized setting? Who's, who's willing Don't to make me Don't we have offer? to get Corey on, on here so, to help us create the, the proper real estate NFT for this to work? The, the fractionalized you know, liquidity across multiple real estate markets? I mean, everybody knows that Corey's gone full crypto, full NFT. Like he doesn't even trade trad markets anymore. I know, that's all his audience, <laughs> like his, his following, it's all, all crypto. It's kind of crazy. He's, I don't know he's irresponsibly like long. I mean, this guy's like, oh, he's no. off his rocker. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Oh. Yep, we're gonna see nothing but rebalancing premium Ouch. and and crypto <laughs> NFT in his yeah. in his uh, yeah his profile. I, I would like All to point he's out putting that out is like uh, bored ape monkey videos every day. Then he put another one on this morning. Jesus Christ, honestly. Uh, really dumb good. idea. And Corey's probably gonna kill me for this. By the way, isn't there is there a regulatory burden against me drinking champagne while we're on a on a a live show here? Is like uh. What would be interesting, I always thought, it's like, what if you could use Bored Apes as a utility token that were tied to like all of our funds and it was like a race and everybody could bet on like who's going to win the race, like via our Bored Apes that then uh, that are the utility securitized tokens for our individual like strategies. Wouldn't that be like an interesting way to use like a Bored Ape? Yeah, I know Mike likes it. Come on, Mike. I'm, 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 I'm like, you're, yeah, you're stretching my, my, my gray matter. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, a, a like crumb of a you know derivative. I, of a... I love it. I love it when it's different. Yeah. So I'm, it, it, it appeals to my fringeness for sure. I mean, let's do it. Show me where I'm betting. What can I bet on? What does he look like? Exactly. <laughs> the, th the problem is the three of you are never going to agree on what you want the board, which board ape to buy. Oh, absolutely not. Well, we get to run our own <laughs> portfolios there, right? Yeah, it's I your own portfolio that, under the board ape, but the the actual like uh, the the features of the board ape, you guys would never agree. Oh, oh yeah, yeah it, maybe. it would be a, it would be an amalgamation that none of us liked at the end. Be perfect. No, that's true. I think we should we should we should close this conversation by saying how proud I am that Corey has embraced the rebalancing premium. <laughs> yes, as being as being a legitimate phenomenon. And how pleased number one number one that. source alpha, yeah. <laughs> how, how he's going to put that in his in his profile on Twitter, and we should shut this down before his YouTube feed catches up to our conversation, oh, so exactly. he doesn't get a chance to respond. <laughs> I, I I also want to say that in order to understand recursion, you must first understand recursion. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no truer words. Yeah. I wanted to wrap. Some of that earlier conversation. And, Thanks and, for coming, oh, Emil. Yeah, Emil, I loved your comment that that Russia has done such a poor job of promoting nihilism. It's wrecked it for all of us. Yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm surprised. I missed that comment. That's good. I, I'm surprised Emil's on here. Like he's he's way too smart and equanimous for all of us. Like I'm surprised he stayed on for this long. That's that's that was <laughs> shocking to me. Like everybody, yeah. like go like. 
I mean, what they're, I mean, the amount of content they produce at such a high quality is just mind boggling to me. It is like, I want to give awesome. you guys a shout out. That's why I, I literally did wear my best pajama shirt and have champagne today because like you guys do this every Friday and I know how hard that is. Like I truly know. Well, I know, I know how know. hard it is pro pro to produce content is such a difficult thing. It's so much harder than people realize. And you guys consistently do it week in and week out. Now, granted, uh, you know, Emil and Jeff are doing it at a much higher level than all of us. But like to come on live every week, like it's much harder than people realize. And and here's what I want to say. And I've really been thinking about this too much lately is I always wonder why nobody else in our industry really does this. Right. It's a form of blue ocean in the sense that I think our entire industry is afraid to do this. They're afraid to have a, a, a drink and come on and talk live for two hours because you can expose yourself. And everybody in our industry is so buttoned up and they want to say they're the they're the wizard behind the curtain and they have, you know, perfect crystal balls or perfect scarcity into what's going to happen in the future. And they don't want to look fallible. And so by us being on for two hours at a time, week after week after week, you're exposing yourself to the audience and either they're going to like you or not. But to me, that's the entire point. But I, I, I honestly like no bullshit, like applaud your guys' courage to be able to do this week in and week out because you're showing people exactly who you are. And our industry is all about not showing people who you are because they're so afraid of getting exposed. Right back at you, brother. Yeah. Right back yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. That's, Don't that's a use great that way word to expose too because Mike, you know, Mike likes to expose. Expose yeah. himself. <laughs> Yeah, he's a, oh, it's Friday. Deep, deep V here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I uh, mean, I wish I could be on Mike's boat this weekend, man. I'm I'm super jelly. Yeah, <laughs> we're going tomorrow. Well, he's off. He's off for for uh, to Africa. Uh, yeah, we are going. We're, we are going out tomorrow, though. Oh, are you? Yeah, okay, yeah. that's good. All right, All right guys. Folks. All right, gents. gentlemen. Thank Jason, you so much. thank you for hosting this. Jason. Season. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for hosting this yeah. this rips today. <laughs> you guys are hungover. I had to carry it a little bit. Like I'm you happy. Did, that's you put question. us on your shoulders Absolutely. and carried us the whole way. It was great. Um, <laughs> and this is the but just for for everyone's uh, benefit. This is the last riffs that we're going to host. Um, that's anyways that's in the schedule until September. We've got a whole list of new uh, and returning guests for September. Really looking forward to getting um, some people on that have been by far our uh, most engaged with guests and uh so we look forward to everyone i think chris schindler's our first one uh, in september yep. coming back, kicking it right? off with so, chris schindler starting with yeah. the, the best that'll of the be, best uh, that'll be a lot of, of best of the best exactly. be fantastic yeah. yeah all right so we, we, right, we gents, left jason. on a high note with jason appreciate yes. you man yep have a great summer folks thanks all for right, guys. have a great summer in. we'll talk soon most investors feel comfortable with their domestic equity and bond portfolios because they tend to thrive during periods of economic growth and low inflation. And we don't blame you. It's been a great ride. But it's a big world out there, full of opportunities you may be ignoring. Sadly, we live in a world dominated by a fear of missing out, or FOMO. And in the last 10 years, U.S. equities and bonds have outperformed and generated massive amounts of FOMO. This hasn't always been the case. In the mid-2000s, the best performing markets were international equities, especially emerging markets, golden commodities. So what happens if growth collapses and inflation becomes the new norm? Or what if the U.S. dollar collapses and U.S. assets are no longer attractive? What will the new FOMO markets be? And will your portfolio keep up or be left behind? Enter Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund, ticker RDMIX a strategy that is designed to thrive across different markets and economic regimes. Unlike most traditional strategies that keep allocation static and let volatility happen, adaptive asset allocation applies a proprietary systematic process designed to dynamically transition toward thriving asset classes and eliminate those that are not, all the while aiming for consistent volatility and stable returns. There's almost always a bull market somewhere in the world. Don't let yesterday's FOMO get in the way of tomorrow's opportunities. Instead, let Adaptive Asset Allocation help you fill in your domestic portfolio gaps. To learn more, visit RationalMF.com and check out the Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund.